welcome you to our midweek uh, pastor's Bible study once again. Thanks for all of you who tune in. We know that these are not always easy studies. Uh, it's just getting down into the scriptures and digging through uh, the text that God has given to us and looking at some maybe, some, maybe looking at some things that, uh, oh, we don't often look at maybe on a Sunday morning or some of the other times when we gather together. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to be able to teach on some what I believe are very important aspects of God's Word. And as we have been doing each week, we start off with this wonderful passage that Jesus said to us. Just before He ascended, He wanted to focus upon the Old Testament, and that's what we're looking at tonight. Jesus said to the disciples before He ascended into heaven, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So there is a lot in the Old Testament in those three sections of the Hebrew Bible that Jesus would have used and in fact read from in the book of Isaiah, for example, where you'd see him in the temple. And uh, they all speak about him. So we're trying to find those ways that it speaks about Jesus in his first coming, his second coming. And uh, as we looked at last week in Psalm 45, actually gives kind of the picture of the life of Christ. Uh, you don't always see it as you read it maybe the first few times, but the more you dig in, you realize there's more to some of these passages than maybe we will see on a, we're a cursory or simplistic reading of the text. Jesus then wanted them to understand that we need to open our minds to the scriptures. And so we're going to do that tonight. Here are a couple of Psalms that we looked at, like, <coughs> looked at last week. Psalm 83. Uh, this is where a lot of us experience uh, our really our spiritual journey. It says, O oh God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent. O oh God, do not be still. When is God going to rise up? It talks about the enemies that make an uproar. God, when are you going to settle the score? Now, we're not in the business of seeking vengeance or judgment. That's not my job. That's not your job. But there are those in the Psalms when they express themselves, and often the Psalms are sort of hyper, this hyper illustrated or ex uh, examined way of understanding how we want God to work, they express it in this way. God, we want you to rise up. Don't be still anymore. Uh, another psalm that speaks to that is Psalm 79. It says, How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath upon the nations. Now, this is the psalmist. This is a literature uh, that is known by hy hyperbole and uh, exaggeration to make a point. And we don't speak that way here. I'm not speaking that way tonight, uh, nor do we speak this way on Sunday mornings or any other time. We, we don't ask God to pour out His wrath on the nations. But that is an emphasis that we see in the Scriptures, that they know that there is this wrath of God that Jesus comes to prevent for all who believe in Him, but we know that there will be a day when that will be settled, and that therefore brings me to the point of tonight's message. I'm going to be talking about something that maybe you've heard about, maybe you haven't heard about. Uh, there is this theme that we want to be looking at as we get into some of the prophets like Joel and Amos and Obadiah the next three weeks. Each of those writers, those Old Testament prophets, they speak about this thing called the Day of the Lord. So I thought it would be interesting to sort of dig a little bit deep before we get into those Old Testament prophets, let me give you kind of a big picture of what is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is used repeatedly in Scripture. It's used 19 different times by eight different Old Testament authors. It's also in the New Testament as well. You see it in 1 Thessalonians, you see it in 2 Thessalonians, you see it in 2 Peter chapter 3. They all talk about this day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? And when you see something in Scripture that is used repeatedly over and over and over, uh, it makes us stop and say, Lord, what is this and why is it repeated so often? It's a phrase that's not just a bunch of words put together, but it's a phrase that has meaning and impact. There is a day, and by using the word day, it doesn't mean a 24-hour period. It's actually using a period of time, a, a season of the history of the world. So the day of the Lord is, a, is an expression that we will see in Scripture, and I want to teach on what that really means. It's, it's often used in three ways. Sometimes the day of the Lord is referencing the period of time in which the author is writing. 
For example, we'll see in Joel chapter 1 and 2, uh, there was a day of the Lord that was occurring while Joel was living or sometime close to his uh, time in history. And uh, there is a day of the Lord that talks about the foreign nations that are going to be under God's wrath someday. And then thirdly, there is the day of the Lord that talks about a future time of judgment. This is not something that we often will preach on on Sundays, and I admittedly, I don't do that very often. It's not always something that is easily received or understood, and the context can be taken uh, wrongly. And so therefore, we, we are very careful about this. But when we have a study like this on Wednesday night, I want to dig down a little bit deeper on this term because Jesus talks about it, Peter talks about it, Paul talks about it, and many of the Old Testament prophets talk about it. So let me give you the big picture. Now, one thing I didn't say in the introduction is that there is an outline on the uh, website that I encourage you to get a hold of. I put all these scriptures on there and all these points are going to be there. And if you want to have future reference for it, that's great. And I'm glad it's doing this online. Uh, I'd like to have a reference point to say, if you want to learn about the Day of the Lord, you go back to this particular Wednesday night study online and uh, you can download it in a way to understand it maybe a little bit deeper or maybe for some of you it's just a review or for some of you it's uh, brand new information. So let's look at the Day of the Lord. I'm going to read through a bunch of scriptures. Now again, these are on the outline um, and uh, I'm going to save you from having to look them all up, although I still encourage you to read each of these in context. But notice what these passages tell us as they all use this phrase, the Day of the Lord. Here's Joel 1.15. We'll look at Joel next Wednesday night. In Joel chapter 1, he's talking about the locusts that are coming in. There's just kind of this disastrous thing that is occurring there. But he says in Joel 1.15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. The day of the Lord is something God is in control of. It is something that it is His responsibility. Sometimes we think, oh, I want to seek revenge, or I want judgment on this person, or that group, or that nation, or that political leader. It's not our job to do that. Our job is to step back and be the messenger and the message of Jesus Christ to people who need Him. But there is a day, and there is a day of the Lord, that will someday occur. And in Joel 1, it shows an illustration of what that might be like. We'll see that next Wednesday night. Then there's Joel chapter 2, verse 1, that we must be ready. In Joel 2, 1, he says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, Jerusalem, uh, the place where God's temple would reside, both in the past and the future, and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. That's the mountain where Jerusalem is currently placed. And let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. Sound the trumpet, because I want you to be ready. I want you to be aware there is a day of the Lord coming, and I want you to be ready for it, and I'll show you about that as we get into it. In Joel chapter 2, verse 11, see, Joel uses this term quite a bit. In Joel 2, 11, none can endure without the Lord. It says, the Lord utters His voice before His army. Uh, I'll talk about who that army is uh, next Wednesday night. It's not necessarily the army of the future, but it might have been the army of the Assyrians or some power that was there around the time of Joel as well. It says, Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? You cannot endure the day of the Lord without Jesus Christ, without God's grace and God's blessing upon your life. And so this is one of the important reasons why it's, it's critical for us to understand that there is going to be a day of the Lord, and we shouldn't live as if there will be no day of the Lord. When we get into the book of Amos in a couple of weeks, uh, there's a group of people that were living very wealthy, very affluent lifestyles, had beautiful homes, and yet they were socially unjust. Uh, they were exploiting the poor, and God warns about the day of the Lord, and, and they thought they were exempt from it. So the point is, as we will see as we get into these passages, understanding the big picture of the day of the Lord and then seeing how it's relevant in specific situations like in Joel and in Amos. But none can endure without it. So we need the Lord before the day of the Lord should occur. In Joel chapter 2, verse 31, again he uses this term. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. One thing that we will see as we get into Joel is that Jesus quotes from Joel regarding this sign that will occur in nature 
about the day of the Lord. So even Jesus is bringing up the day of the Lord, and it's some future event to his life at that time when he said it in Matthew chapter 24. Then the day of the Lord is, is located in somewhere in Israel. There's going to be this catastrophe that's going to occur. It says in Joel 3.14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And again, next week in Joel, we'll discuss where that valley is. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So God is going to bring about this, this climax of the day of the Lord in a particular valley that we will describe for you next Wednesday night. But it's important to understand that God has this all mapped out. He, he is in charge. He's going to bring this to a specific location and execute this day of the Lord, which is a day of wrath and it's a day of judgment. It's also in Amos chapter 5. I just spoke of Amos just a moment ago. There Amos talks about it in 5, 18 through 20. It's a time of darkness, much as Jesus said it was a time of darkness in Matthew 24. He says, Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness, not light. It's not something you want to be part of. Darkness has this awesome sense of sin and, and rebellion and destruction and disaster. Well, the day of the Lord is something that is still percolating. It's still going to occur. It happened in the days of Joel and Amos to a certain extent, but it's also in those days a sort of prefiguring of what the day of the Lord will look like in the future when there will be this ultimate day of the Lord that will occur. Obadiah, we're going to look at Obadiah. It's just one, one very simple chapter of book, but it's a rich book. I think you will enjoy as we get into the sort of the image of Christ that is found in the book of Obadiah. But in Obadiah, verse 15, one chapter, it's going to be worldwide. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done it, will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. And uh, so God is saying there will be a day of justice. Remember Psalm, in the two Psalms that I read earlier, God, where are you? How, how long will you be quiet? Well, there will be a day when he's no longer quiet. And he will address the uproar of the nations and those who rebelled against him. Obadiah shows that it's going to happen in a worldwide cataclysmic way. We also see in Zephaniah, another one of these great Old Testament prophets. It's, uh, it's kind of a warning to us. It says, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. <laughs> again, repeated over and over and over again. That's why we're talking about it tonight. For the Lord has pre prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guest. We'll look at that in greater detail. But the idea is that each of these prophets are exhorting the people of the land in that day for the day of the Lord that may occur around them, but also in a way in its exhortation to you and me that there is a forecasting of a future day of the Lord that we should learn from what they experienced so that we're ready for what we might experience when that future day comes for all the world in the future. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 15 describes it as a day of wrath and distress and trouble. Near is the great day of the Lord, near coming very quickly. Listen to the day of the Lord. He repeats it twice right in a row. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly, a day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress. And it goes on to describe this very miserable experience. So we need to be aware that it's a time of, of wrath of God that he brings upon even his own people. Zechariah 14, we'll look at that in a little bit greater detail as well, but let me just touch on the first couple of verses. In Zechariah 14, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ he's referring to. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. We're going to look at that a little bit further in the, in the next uh, section when we get into it. But this is showing that, that God is warning that much as it did occur, the day of the Lord did occur in Joel 1 and 2 and in Zephaniah, but it is still future to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's the second coming of Christ when a lot of these events will, will unfold. And I'll show you the events of the day of the Lord here in a moment. But we also see in 2 Thessalonians, again, the day of the Lord. The Apostle Paul is writing about this to the Thessalonians who uh, were living way back in that first century A.D. He says, We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and are gathering together to Him, it can be confusing, this day of the Lord, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by spirit or a message 
or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The Thessalonians thought that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. Uh, they might have seen him crucified. They, they might have heard stories about his ascension into heaven. And they were expecting Jesus to come right back and establish his kingdom. And the Apostle Paul says, no, no, he's not coming back in your lifetime, Thessalonians, or my lifetime, Paul would say. And we don't know when he's coming back. But we do know that they were uh, fearful that the day of the Lord is already occurring. And so it was future to the Thessalonians. It's future to you and me. There's no indication that the day of the Lord has yet occurred. But it can be confusing. And uh, God does not want us to be troubled by that. And the beauty is that Jesus came to take the wrath of God. And that's, the, that's sort of the bottom line. That wrath that will come upon the nations, that wrath does not fall upon those who are believers in Jesus. He took the wrath of our sin so that he could give to us the righteousness of his character. And so that's the beauty of this. And that's where Paul wants to warn them, but help them in their confusion about the day of the Lord. But he also says in 1 Thessalonians 5, these words, Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So it's going to come in a surprising way because that's how thieves come into people's homes. It's not like you're ready for the thief of the night, although you should be prepared, but you don't know when that day will occur. And he goes on to describe some of those details as well. So let me outline for us some of the events of the day of the Lord. Uh, we're just going to talk about this tonight. It's a lot to absorb. And then next Wednesday night, we'll get into Joel and a little bit more about the day of the Lord as well. But notice some of these events. I've listed them again on the outline that's available for you. Some of the events include a political ruler that will make peace with Israel. And uh, we're not going to take time to read all these passages. They're there for you to look at if you'd like to. But in Daniel chapter 9, there's this, this covenant that will be established with this individual that we call the Antichrist or the Beast. And so he will establish this relationship with Israel. And uh, we don't know what that's going to be like and who that person is. And there's all sorts of speculations about it. All we know is that there's going to be this political, peaceful reunion, uh, union, I should say, with the nation of Israel. Then there will be a lot of false religion and a false prophet. Revelation chapter 13 talks a lot about that, and another time we can explore that. But, but all the false belief systems that are out there. Uh, we're living in a day where there's no absolute truth, and there's a, there's a vulnerability just to just about anything that is being taught to believe anything you want to believe. And, my truth is not your truth and that sort of a thing. Well, that's, that's vulnerability to what the false prophet will do as he brings a whole lot of false religion into the world that, again, confuses the people. Even some of God's elect will be led astray by that. Then there will be a heavy judgment that will come upon the, on the world. If you've been in any of my classes when I've taught in the book of Revelation, you know that there are three critical periods of time in this tribulational period. Chapter 6, chapters 8 and 9, chapter 16 unfold this, this story of the, of the terribleness of the last days of the tribulation that Jesus refers to in Matthew 24. Jesus calls it the great tribulation. And then John, when he writes Revelation, he sort of unpacks what that all contains, what that's all about. And so there will be a time of heavy judgment on the world during the day of the Lord. There will be witnesses, though, God never leaves himself without a witness. And there will, there will be witnesses. Then in Revelation 7, there's 144,000. There's the two witnesses of, of, uh, of uh, Revelation as well. And so God is going to preach the word. In fact, Matthew 24 talks about that, that we want the gospel to go to every nation so that everybody has hope. Everybody has a chance to allow the wrath of God to go on Jesus and not themselves. And then there will be a judgment on the false religion. And it's interesting that in Revelation 17 and 18, the false religion there is not what government does. The false religion there is talking about what business has done. And so we need to be aware of what is even occurring around us, not just in government, but also in the business world, in the corporate world, or in the private lives of people and how they handle their finances, because that's where a lot of the corruption has occurred, and, and God brings His wrath upon that in this day of the Lord. And then it'll be culminated in what we refer to as the, the war or the battle of Armageddon. In Revelation chapter 19, you can read that. 
when Jesus Christ comes back riding that white horse and you and I somewhere are in the midst of all of this occurring, and you can read through that text there, you see that he comes back to settle the score. He's helping to bring to a conclusion the tribulational period so that he could establish what he wanted to originally establish when he came the first time, that is, his kingdom on earth. Matthew uh, talks about this kingdom, Matthew's chapters 5 through 7. That was the kingdom message from Jesus, but that kingdom was rejected. And so therefore, he wants to come back and establish that kingdom, which is a beautiful and perfect world in which Christ will rule, and you and I will be part of that world as well. Christ will then return, as I said, and he talks about that in Matthew chapter 24 as well. In fact, Matthew chapter 24 is, is Jesus' prophecy conference. So if you want to read about prophecy from the words of Christ himself, that's Matthew 24. It's interesting, the very last thing that Jesus ever taught was prophecy. He wanted us to be ready. He wanted us to understand the signs of the time. He wanted us to be aware of the details that were occurring. And he knew that this day of the Lord was future, as Paul then and Peter then emphasize it as well. And there will be this final judgment that will occur after Christ returns. He will judge the false prophet. He will judge the beast or the antichrist. And uh, they will be judged and uh, condemned by God. And then there will be a gathering that will occur. A gathering of all the nations will, will, will surround in the nation of Israel once again. And he will gather his people. And he will restore the nation of Israel. That's what Exodus, uh, Exodus, Ezekiel chapter 37 talks about that. He says, I will put my spirit within you. You will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. And it's why one of the reasons we keep looking to Israel. And whatever your politics may be, God is still going to do a work in the nation of Israel. Ezekiel 37 is all about the dried bones, the dead bones, and he, he brings new life to those things. And uh, it's only when the Spirit of God comes into someone that that new life is exhibited. Right now, there's sort of an atheistic or agnostic, Judaistic practicing that is going on there. Uh, but there will be a day when the Spirit of God will come back and give life to that wonderful group of people and to the, to the people that come to that nation as well, Jewish or Gentile, that can all be given new life by the Spirit of God in those final days of the day of the Lord. And then there will be a binding of Satan. He will be cast away and bound together until the final judgment that would occur with him. Jesus will rule in his kingdom on earth in, in Revelation chapter 20. It says there for a thousand years. It repeats that word, I believe, a thousand four times. So a thousand years is a long time. And it's reflective of the, of the, of the kingdom establishment that Jesus will create upon this earth. And that is all part of this day of the Lord as he comes back to restore the nation of Israel and create this beautiful place where worship, once again, can be instituted as he had wanted it to be. And sometimes they had glimpses of that during the days of, of David and Solomon and uh, King Hezekiah. There were moments when they, they had kind of this rich worship going on, but it kept on drifting away. But then there will be this final destruction that, that makes its way uh, for a new heaven and a new earth. Now let me just say something. In Revelation chapter 20, I say I didn't put that on the outline, but Revelation 21, I should say, it talks there about a new heaven and a new earth. When Jesus comes back, he has a kingdom on earth, he destroys the false prophet, the beast, Satan, demons, they're rid of and they're gone, his wrath is upon them, and he establishes the kingdom, we live in righteousness in his kingdom, uh, all those are happening in, not in that chronological order, but all that will take place in that end time. And then the world as we know it today will be burned up so a new earth and a new heaven can be created. Now let me just throw in a little thing that uh, uh, is not really relevant to the day of the Lord, but I'll just throw it in here just for you to think about it. A lot of people believe that in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, and there are the seven days or the six days of work and seventh day of of Sabbath rest by God, that each of those days, like the day of the Lord, those days are periods of time. Now, a lot of people believe that to be the case. Just as the day of the Lord, the word day and the day of the Lord is a long period of time. But here's something interesting. Let me just throw it out as sort of a per parenthetical thought. When God comes back in Revelation chapter tw 21 
And he says, I will create a new heaven, a new earth. And Isaiah, I think it's 66, also talks about this as well. When God comes back to create the new heaven and the new earth, does he do that over hundreds of thousands of years? Or does he do it instantly? Just as when God created Adam. And Adam looked like he had age. Adam, since Jesus is the second Adam, the first Adam, therefore probably around age 30, at least looked like he was 30. I would guess somewhere in the 20 to 30 year range view because I don't see anything to indicate that God created Adam to be a, a baby and then somehow God helped him grow up to have the appearance of age. It seems as though he created Adam and then Eve at full maturity. So the appearance of age. That's what a lot of people say about the six days of creation. There's the appearance of age that looks like it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, our world has been in existence. Well, what's intriguing to me is to think that when God then comes back in Revelation 21, he creates this new heaven and this new earth, there is certainly a sense in that passage that it's not going to be created over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. It certainly, it certainly gives us the idea that God's just going to speak the word, and the world as we know it today will cease to exist and burn up in a flame of fire, and then he will create this new heaven and this new earth instantly. God can do that. I think God will do that. And I think, therefore, when we read Genesis 1 and 2, we need to read it in light of what is God going to do in Revelation 21. If he does it in Revelation 21 instantly, could he have done it in Genesis 1 and 2 instantly, like Adam with the appearance of age? Close parentheses, something for you to think about. But I wanted to bring us to the conclusion of, of this night's message, and it comes out of Peter. Peter's this wonderful, wonderful disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes he got himself in trouble, but boy, you love, you love his diligence, his enthusiasm, and stepping forward, this type A of just going out and going for it. Even if he gets it wrong, he's going to go for it. The very last thing that Peter writes, he writes two books, two letters, First and Second Peter. And the book of Second Peter, the very last thing Peter writes about is the day of the Lord. I want you to read with me what Peter writes about the day of the Lord, because this is where it relevant, is relevant for you and for me. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Remember Paul, he said, like a thief in the night. So it's going to come unexpectedly. Well, in light of that, in which the heavens and will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. So the world that we live in today will cease to exist. So God is the one who will destroy this world. We need to keep it clean. We need to be concerned about uh, climate change and things like that. But God is still in charge of this world. So he is the one who will burn this place up. But you and I in Christ, we're not going anywhere. We're still following him. So this world as we know it today will be destroyed in that way. And then he says, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, burning up the world as we know it today, therefore, what sort of people ought you to be? I love that idea. You know, we can get all built up about future, prophetic, what we call eschatological things, and yet Peter sort of boils it all down and says, look, yeah, this is going to happen. There's going to be this day of the Lord. There's going to be this final destruction. There's going to be this time of darkness and the sun and the moon and all the things that Jesus even references. Joel and Amos and Obadiah, Zechariah and Zephaniah, they all talk about it. But he says, what, what difference should it make for you and me today? And this is the application. What sort of people ought you to be? We ought to be people in holy conduct and godliness. We shouldn't be people of vengeance and bitterness and unforgiveness and, and strife. We should be people who are holy, people who are godly, looking for and listening for the coming, the hastening of the coming of the day of God. We should be anticipating it. We should be inviting others into that holy world that we live in, not out of pride or presumptuous living, but, but out of humility that God would choose us to be 
holy through Christ, not because of what I did, but because of what Christ did for me. But we should be hastening the coming of the day of God, this day, hastening it, looking forward to it, in anticipation of it, as a thief is coming into our home. We're alert to the conditions of those things that might allow that thief to get into our home. We need to be alert to the conditions that that day of the Lord might present before us and help others be ready for it. So it goes on to say, hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's our hope. That righteousness of a new heaven and a new earth, that's what God does. And by believing in Jesus today, I become part of that righteous new world that God will create for everyone. And you know what? He also talks about in 1 Peter who, that we should always have a defense for everyone who asks of the hope that lies within us. We live in a world where there's a lot of chaos, a lot of anxiety, a lot of concern. Even there's increased areas of suicide, things that are very disturbing, depression and, and sadness that is occurring around us. We who are people of God, we see the future. We know what God is in charge of. We know this is in God's hands. But he calls for us to live in holiness and godliness, looking for the coming of Christ and invite as many people as we can on that journey to be living the life of Christ and then to be sharing the life of Christ that others can escape the day of the Lord. That's the day of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for your presence here with us. Thank you for your word, as hard as it is. God, this is, this is some difficult things to understand. And frankly, it's a little bit intimidating to think about this day that will someday occur for the nations. So help us, Lord, to be ready. Help us to live the holy and godly life. And help us to encourage others to have that same hope that they would look to you and we would help direct them to you as well. So we pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.